Well, for years now, Nigeria has waged a war against corruption and the verdict of the battle remains undetermined as more people continue to commit crimes, putting the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission on its toes to tackle an issue that seems endemic. And so far, it's been a case of you win some, lose others, even under various heads of the anti-graft agency. This time, the man at the helm of affairs, Ola Olukoyede, has uh, pledged that under his leadership, the ASCC would carry out a broad-based and holistic anti-graft war that wouldn't spare anyone, no matter how highly placed the individual is. He says the recent arraignment of two former governors is a demonstration that the EFCC would treat no one as a sacred cow and will spare no mega thieves. And joining us now... Uh, for this discussion is uh, strategist, policy analyst, group CEO, global investment and trade company, GITC. Baba Yusuf joins us from our Abuja studios. Good morning. It's good to see you again. Good morning, Kemi and Theophilus. Good to be here. Right. Welcome to the program. And uh, well, despite Mr. Lukoyede's uh, sessions, how is it looking at to you, uh, talking about this anti-corruption war? Well, thank you for having me, uh, Mr. Lukwede. I think is becoming very popular with what I call saber rattling, you know, uh, and uh, tough rhetorics with regards to his stance of intention to fight uh, economic and financial crime, which is not bad. It's okay, but I think essentially what is going to be key is for us to have you know, outcomes. We need to see some traction and action. Uh, Mr. Olukwede, or rather the EFCC, needs to build practical, critical momentum going forward because um, saber rattling for an institution like the EFCC is good for it to come, come once in a while uh, and then for, for the EFCC to work more behind the scene to ensure that uh, they are able to get it right and be more sure-footed with regards to getting results and for that i would like to remind us of the mission statement of the efcc which i think will guide our conversations and the mission statement is that uh, the efcc is to eradicate economic and financial crimes through prevention enforcement and coordination and i think further down the line i will bear my mind with regards to the very critical pillars that will help or, you know, EFCC to deliver, you know, and make the critical impacts needed at this very crucial moment in the socio-economic history of this country. Right, so you mentioned something about EFCC getting its rights, and um, in assessing its leadership, you mentioned that um, uh, you gave some words about the EFCC's um, uh, activities so far under Olukayode. Uh, what do you do you think EFCC has been effective in fighting corruption? Of course, this is about over 20 years since the EFCC was uh, created. Over the years, has it been effective in fighting uh, corruption in Nigeria? Well, by and large, uh, Theophilus, the effectiveness of uh, a very crucial, uh, you know, anti-corruption or economic and financial crime institution like the EFCC is going to be is always going to be a factor of the readiness of the president commander in chief you know to fight corruption the the, the style of leadership of the man driving the, the the country will determine the performance of the efcc and the man in charge suffice it to say if we want to do an appraisal of the efcc over you know over 20 years since it came into existence i will say that uh, the impacts have not been so significant. Uh, and of course, part of the reason is not uh, of the doing of the EFCC as an institution, but because also the EFCC is a subset of an overarching society called Nigeria, uh, whose you know value there are erosions of value system of the country in its entirety, and fighting a humongous, you know, endemic you know, uh, criminal enterprise and uh, corruption value chain of this nature, you know, of course will be long-standing, but effectively we will we need to see more sure-footedness of the EFCC to be able to gain traction and deliver. 
especially with regards to what I mentioned, prevention, mm -hmm. and also critical is the process. Because uh, many at times we see the EFCC have very solid cases, but they are not able to effectively prosecute and secure the kind of convictions we would like to see based on some of these uh, uh, process issues, if you like, or lack of political will of the president, as the case may be at the time, uh, which is very, very key. The political will of the president will determine the appetite of EFCC as an institution to deliver uh, the, the political interference and other complications that will come due to operations, funding, and uh, adequate resources like man and material may be hampering them. But essentially, I think EFCC can still do better, you know, going forward. Uh, with regards to the experiences they have gained so far, uh, the person of Mr. Ulukwede, who has been in the institution for a while, and we have a president that says he's definitely going to talk tough and fight tough on corruption. For him to be able to succeed, indeed, fighting corruption is going to be a critical success factor for President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. We wait to see how this is going to play out in the next three and a half years. So you mentioned that the body language of the present administration in power, any administration in power, uh, determines the activities of uh, the EFCC and how far it goes. So are you saying that the EFCC is not independent on its own in fighting corruption? Of course, uh, Theophilus, it goes without saying. If we look at the act setting of EFCC, it's very clear that the EFCC is not autonomous. I mean, if we are, I'm one of the proponents, and for a very long time, I'm following the growing number of eminent Nigerians and the good Nigerians that are saying we should separate the office of the, you know, uh, Minister of Justice from the Attorney General of the Federation. If you start it from there, you can uh, agree with me that uh, the institutions of fighting corruption in Nigeria, of which one of the critical ones is EFCC are not independent. That being said, it is not the, func the independence that is the issue, but the readiness of the leader and to correct you is not about the present administration. It's all the time the president of the country will determine how the fight against corruption goes. You know, uh, so if he wants it to be done in a way and manner that it will be more result oriented, definitely it's going to happen. And that is what we will wait to see in the current administration. Already, Mr. Olukwede has hit the ground running. We've seen some action, you know, taken. Uh, there are ongoing prosecutions here and there, but uh, we will urge the EFCC to be more active in trying to prevent and ensuring we secure proper convictions and a bit less tapering down on the saber rattling. Because, you see, the saber rattling is not bad, but then when you are fighting you know, a, a corruption value chain as we have in Nigeria with the vested interest. As you are saying by Ratlin, they are also going back to their strategic blueprint to, to you know, to recraft their strategies on how they can, you know, defend. You know, so if you have an offensive strategy that is more frontal than an offensive strategy that comes with what I call the SS and what is the silence and the stealth, you know, uh, strategy, which is more effective over time if you look at the FBI, the Scotland Yard and other, you know, sister organizations that have similar functions. They adopt what I call the SS strategy. Silence and state. You should be felt more than you should be seen. And you make more impact that way because based on that SS strategy that I talked about, you have the element of the last S and that is the surprise. And that element of surprise, I tell you, Theophilus and Kemi, is always productive when you are fighting vested interests that are always, most of the time, a step ahead when they know your game plan or your intent. I'm particularly interested in, um, you know, the issue of prevention of crimes uh, of this nature, which is uh, a key mandate of the EFCC. And um, when you look at what you've already alluded to, corruption fighting back the empire, that financial crimes uh, have been, especially with, um, you know, on the mega scale that the EFCC says it is, um, you know, pursuing what are your thoughts on how, you know, this issue of prevention can be achieved, bearing in mind that, you know, many of these individuals enjoy immunity at the critical time when uh, these, these crimes are, are, are perceived to have been committed? Thank you very much for that question, Kemi. Now, 
based on that, before I answer, I want to also, you know, draw our attention to uh, what is called the EFCC strategic blue and uh, strategic plan 20 to 2021 to 2025. And within this document, they unveiled it in 2021, which I believe is subsisting till 2025 next year. I picked out some three very important uh, strategic objectives, which has to do with what you, the question you asked about prevention. Very important. One is to, that uh, the, the objective number one is to increase public engagement in the fight against economic and financial crime. <clears throat> Excuse me. Objective number two is to improve systems and processes for the prevention of economic and financial crime. And then I skipped objective three and go to objective four, which is germane to this conversation, is to, imp to improve law enforcement coordination and collaboration with relevant stakeholders, you know, uh, to achieve success. If you look at these three cardinal objectives, Within the subsistence strategic plan of EFCC, it aligns with what I was saying, which you are also emphasizing. Because indeed, the cost of fighting or executing or prosecuting uh, uh, economic and financial crime or corruption that have already been done is higher than prevention. And the prevention is more strategic because the thing about pre uh, 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 fighting and being reactive in terms of fighting criminality or corruption is that the deed has already been done. If it is money, the money has already been lost. It is in the hands of the vested interest. They have been empowered to fight. They use the money they have stolen, Kemi, to fight back. So if you prevent, you are being proactive. And by being proactive, you are able to stop wastages. You are able to block leakages. And you are able to enhance the... The, 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 the assets uh, and, 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 the, and the financial capacity of Nigeria and our economy rather than being reactive. And you will agree with me, this strategic plan, which is very good and solid, is more solid on prevention. And taking it forward, what they have said here in the plan already, you know, encrossed what it should be. I will take us to objective number two, which is very key. Improve systems and processes for the prevention of economic and financial crime. Why is it so important for me more than any other in the case of ESCC at this point in time is because we have seen based on the over 20 years existence of EFCC, uh, some of the very notable cases that would have gotten maybe better conviction or more traction in achieving success have to do with lapses in the process. Process is critical in law enforcement. Process is critical in risk assessment. And I dare say the EFCC should also note that part of their job is actually risk assessment and risk management. Corruption is in, in another function is a risk and in another function is a threat. So when you are doing risk assessment and you are seeing it from a risk mitigation perspective also, you will be sure that your processes and procedures and your systems are able to detect on time and you are able to be proactive. And then when it happens also, you have processes that are followed strictly in adherence with the rule of law to ensure that these quote and unquote bad guys don't go away with crime. Because what happens is that when there is a loophole in our processes of prosecution, uh, in, the, uh, in the execution of our criminal justice system, then they go to court and they are able to get a leeway to escape without the kind of conviction that will deter people going forward from you know, committing those crimes, which is very important. So compliance with rules and regulation, ensuring you follow the processes. And like I said earlier, uh, like I'm advocating the SS strategy, silence, I mean, and stealth. What do you do? Just like they do in the United States of America, in the United Arab Emirates, and other countries, Singapore, UK, what do they do? They take time to investigate marshal out their plans, get enough evidence before they make their move. When you see them making their move in those countries, the job is almost as good as done. But when you now are more vocal with your activities or plan, and you go maybe with 20, 30% or 40% you know, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, evidences, 
you have already given these people a head start to be able to find a way to circumvent the system or work on the loophole of the process within the legal framework to be able to go out either with less conviction or even you know at the end of the day as we are seeing in some cases efcc losing cases that they shouldn't have lost in the first place so it's very so you believe Im point, immunity shouldn't be a problem you you believe that uh, the efcc can still work their way despite immunity enjoyed uh, by this uh, you know politically exposed individuals now that's another very important angle kemi uh, the, and the immunity part of it, which you are talking about now, maybe the governors or maybe the president, let us note that if we look at the entire corruption value chain in Nigeria, with all due respect, the people that are enjoying those immunity are a lesser percentage of those others that are not enjoying immunity. But let's come back to the immunity issue. The immunity issue now is a, if you are doing a SWOT analysis for EFCC, it is not a weakness on their side, but a threat on their side because it is not their own making. It's a provision within the Constitution which cannot be circumvented. And that goes to another leg of the, what EFCC should do, along with other advocates of anti-corruption, to work on what legislation, to review our Constitution. And what a better time than, what a better time than now that already we have committees that have been set up you know at the instance of mr president to review our to, to 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 review our constitution to amend our constitution that's the right word and this amendment of the constitution has already commenced and i have said in many fora calling on also nigerians to be part of this process to ensure that we add our voices with regards to this immunity clause you know within the constitution which gives cover to you know uh, bad leaders that hide under this immunity clause and inadvertently or deliberately make it difficult for an EFCC to prosecute in that instance. But that being said, that is not an excuse for EFCC to do better. Indeed, you can also have a strategy, what I call the linchpin strategy, to anchor critical players within the value chain of corruption for you to be able to get those people that have immunity. Uh, one of the sore so part of this immunity is we also see that there are some provisions that even if the people leave the office within which they have that immunity, they still find a way to still evade justice. So uh, uh, the process, like I said, is very important and it's a work in progress. And because it's a work in progress, part of what we should all do as Nigerians is to ensure that immunity clause is not used to give cover to anybody indeed from mr president down to continue perpetrating the evil of corruption in nigeria but then they are just a subset i agree they hold critical national asset of this country but we should start somewhere and head somewhere and improve as we proceed okay so in improving as we proceed how important is the use of technology in effectively fighting corruption in nigeria no, oh, wow, that's a very important one because we are living in a global, in a, in a global village. And as you know, uh, technology is driving the entire fight against terrorism, fight against corruption. So uh, it goes without saying that um, technology is very key. It's a critical success factor. The capacity, the ability, you know, and the know-how of and the investment you know, deployed on technology for an institution like EFCC is a critical success factor. But more importantly, the ability to use it and the how it is used by the EFCC is very important. You can have an asset, but how you deploy it is very important. It goes back to the process. If we take an instance for a bit with regards to the case of uh, quote-unquote horse puppy who was arrested, you know, in the United Arab Emirates and convicted in the prosecuted and convicted in the United States of America, a high level collaboration between the US and the UAE. You, you see what I talk about the process. They took their time to follow this corruption value chain, gather their evidence, marshal their plans, and the day we saw the, the, the interagency collaboration, you know, uh, across the two countries going in to take on these guys they were already good to go. They deployed technology throughout that process. 
but importantly, not just deploying the technology, but the methodology and the process, I repeat, are very important. Because even when you deploy technology, but the methodology is faulty, or the process is faulty, these people will still get away. We are dealing with very, in very intelligent and highly connected you know, criminal you know, enterprise across the world, whether they are politically exposed or whether they are the terrorists or other financial crime, you know, uh, corruption value chain. So it is very important that uh, we use technology. And of course, why not? We have the National Financial Intelligence Unit, the NFIU, which is, you know, uh, basically the, the hub of uh, gathering data and mining it and sharing information, you know, with uh, the likes of EFCC and other agencies of government to fight corruption, to fight terrorism, etc. So technology, of course, is very important, but how it is deployed and how it is used in terms of methodology, in terms of process, in terms of execution quotient are very critical for success. Okay, so will you advocate that the EFCC should be scrapped, as many people believe that um, it's not effectively fighting against corruption. Rather, it has become a problem in itself rather than become the solution. Uh, no, that will be throwing away the baby to bad To contemplate that, to me, to my, in my mind, is actually like a sabotage. We shouldn't contemplate that. EFCC is a noble idea. EFCC has indeed achieved success. We are not, I'm not writing off EFCC, obviously. We are just saying that it should, the successes achieved should be better and going forward should be consolidated. The question I would have expected was with regards to the approval of Mr. President to you know, streamline governance and adoption of the Orosoye report. And maybe the poser would have been the possible merger between ICPC and EFCC for better performance. Those kind of conversations. But we shouldn't have any conversation on the table with regards, in, with regards to the scrapping of the EFCC. It's a big NO. But the institutions should be supported, properly manned, properly monitored, and we are telling them what they should do to be better. That doesn't mean they should be scrapped, but they should step up to the plate because the challenges are enormous. And I, 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 I believe and I hope, I mean, I, I believe as I hope, Mr. President will, you know, put a very important focus on this institution and the fight against corruption because without the fight against corruption, I dare say, Mr. President's noble intention and the Renewed Hope agenda will be a mirage. Right, and um, of course, um, the Code of Conduct Bureau, too, is also added to the mix uh, as um, the Absolutely. Implementation Committee continues its, uh, its work, and Nigerians Absolutely. are also expectant uh, for you know, finality in that regard. But what would be, looking at the structures of you know, these anti-corruption agencies with various mandates, by the way, what, what would be the way to go for you? Uh, if we get to that point, or now that we've gotten to the point where we're talking about mergers? Well, the way to go is to legislate, and uh, I am an advocate that actually we should merge the institutions, uh, the ICPC and the EFCC. If you look at both acts, you see a lot of, uh, you know, uh, cross purposes. Uh, situation and uh, in some cases people are handcuffed from doing one or two things. Let us have a solid institution that will fight crime in its entirety, albeit within the institution we can now have, you know, uh, the units or the divisions that will specialize in focusing in some areas. You know, that will be the right way to go. It's easier to manage, it's more cost effective, it's more efficient, usage of information uh, is better and it will ensure collaboration rather than competition because these institutions should work together and synergize rather than to compete. But the way it is, uh, it's not their fault. Everybody wants to deliver, and at the end of the day, they will be competing rather than collaborating. You know? But then also importantly, which is not just an issue of EFCC. I have said it in this uh, station before when we're talking about you know, reforms in the police and all that. The, they are also a subset of the society. There's also the need, and I'm very happy Mr. Oluko Ede has, has actually agreed with this line of thinking, which is true, that there are, there are bad eggs in this institution, whether it is the Nigerian police or it is the EFCC. 
flushing out those bites beyond the rhetoric is very important because they like you say one bad apple spoils the whole lot i know that we have a corruption issue that cuts across civil service public service private sector but then for you to be able to achieve we cannot throw our hands hopelessly and say it's a hopeless situation but to try as much as possible to weed out as much as we can those because otherwise they will be sabotaging the effort of institutions like efcc i'm happy the efcc chair mentioned it a couple of weeks ago and again mr Olukoedi, we need to see action with that regard set examples and people will fall in line and other people from other institutions will you know follow suit but i agree that there should be a merger of these institutions for better performance and importantly round pegs in round holes performance management to ensure people are delivering if we do that and we have the right performance measures one of the critical performance measures for efcc is not how many people they have convicted how many cases they have in court and taxpayers monies are being wasted away on lawyers with an end in the judicial system i'm going to talk about the judiciary but importantly also how many financial crimes have been have they been able to stop or to prevent should have even heavier weights than the convictions they are trying to secure which sometimes even will go across an, an administration you see them prosecuting a case which is not their fault but over four years they are prosecuting a case so prevention should a, be a very critical heavy weight in trying to determine the performance of these organizations so that they will be more result oriented all right uh bye bye yusuf thank you very much for speaking with us on uh tvc breakfast mr yusuf uh, is a strategist policy analyst and group ceo global investment and trade company many thanks again bye bye yusuf for your, uh, your time with us on tvc breakfast pleasure to be here thank you for having